Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Point Podcast. Today we're here with Pilar Alessandra. Pilar is a script analyst, author, podcast host, host of the On The Page podcast. And you've been doing it for 17 years. 17 years, that's amazing. That's like Joe ah. Rogan level. You were doing it when... <laughs> You were doing it when no one even knew, even knew what a podcast was. Fair play. <laughs> yeah. You know, it really wasn't the dark ages. Everybody says that. It's like, to be honest with you, you know, when I started, everybody was podcasting. Um, but okay. it's it took a dip for a while. It like went out of favor and then it was rediscovered. So a lot of, I mean, as far as the idea of podcasting. So everybody thinks that like, it's like, like you invented it, but no, no, but you know. Me and uh, my peers were doing it. <laughs> yes, I can imagine it went out of favor around the time that short form content. Well, actually, maybe not. 17 years ago, what's that? 2007? 2007 is when it started. Yeah, 2007. Yes. Yeah. It is It is a while ago when I think about it because uh, <laughs> like like there was a bush in office in, in, in my country. <laughs> like, wow. Like that's... Right. So it is It is quite a while ago. You're right. Yeah. No, but it's good. It means that you, I mean, fair play for the dedication to the to the craft. That's you, I can imagine you're probably one of the most experienced <laughs> podcast hosts in the world right now. Maybe not in the world, but. Oh, the, you know, you would think, you would think I would stop saying um and uh and, and blanking out and, you know, stop being nervous um, if I was that experienced. But if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear all those things. So I wish I could say I was wonderful at it, but I'm a teacher rather than a podcaster. So, uh, you know, one of these days, maybe at, at 20 years, I'll get, I'll nail it. We'll see. No, no, I, I've, I've watched, I watched a couple, I've watched a couple of sort of long form interview style questions and you you answer them all really well, so I I think the ums and the ers are part of the endearment for people. When people don't talk like that, it's a bit sort of robotic, and people don't actually like it. Anyway, let's let's get your background, a very brief background, because I'm sure you've said it loads of times. So just the main things, and then where you are now, just to set us off. Okay. Oh, you want me to say it? Yes, you say it. Is that all right? Oh, okay. Sure. So, oh gosh, um, I started as a script reader in my 20s, um, working for Amblin Entertainment, which became DreamWorks. Um, I started reading for a number of companies, uh, Radar Pictures, um, Saturday Night Live Studios, even the Robert Evans Company, um, which is kind of funny. Um, and I learned on the job. And as I was learning, I was learning what was working, what wasn't working, what people were responding to. And I started teaching over at UCLA Extension, over at their writer's program, um, a little bit of what I was learning. Um, and, uh, and people really liked the, the, the fact that I could say, here's the problem, here's how to fix it. Here's a tool. Here's an exercise. So that turned into a book called The Coffee Break Screenwriter. Um, of course, there's the podcast. And now I created my own um, business in 2001 called On the Page. And I do Zoom classes and, um, and Zoom consultations where I work from story to script with clients. So my whole world is scripts. <laughs> wow. That is a good world to be in, though, to be fair. Yes, I've I've read lots of comments and stuff on YouTube about people saying how good you are and how they how thankful they were to go to your, uh, you know, online courses and lessons and stuff. So that's you're obviously doing a very good job in helping people. Thank Did you. you want to get into film? No. Um... I, you know, I was a, th a somewhat trained theater actor mm -hmm. and um, I came out to L.A., which has no theater, um, because yeah. a boyfriend said, hey, let's go to L.A. And then he didn't show up. And uh, right. I got a uh, an agent um, and I, I and all it took was one time of me being on camera 
to realize I was terrible at being an on-camera actor. I mean, I was the worst. I was overacting. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not doing that because I suck at it. So um, I started kind of, you know, I was in my 20s. I was doing a number of little jobs here and there. And then somebody said, I used to love those papers that you wrote in literature class um, mm-hmm. in college. You'd be great at writing coverage for my independent production company. And I was like, hey, that sounds great. Um, and I started uh, reading for them. And then I found out you could get paid for it. I really yeah. loved the idea of analyzing movie movie and TV scripts because I really loved the movies and TV. So it, it's, it, it became the thing I wanted to do, but it wasn't what I was chasing when I, when I got my first job. So you were chasing being an actress? No, I was chasing finding what I wanted to do next since okay. I realized that I wasn't going to be an on-camera actress and I kind of like, and I lost the desire and, you know, so many people in their 20s, you're just seeing what you're good at. You're finding out, you're, you're, you're finding out your life. Like I have a, an oldest in my, in their 20s now and, and my youngest is turning 20 and I'm always saying just your 20s are about finding out. You don't have to have it all figured out. Eventually it will land. Yeah, it's about it's the exploration stage of, a li- of your life, isn't it? And trying to maybe open as many doors as possible. But also the great thing about being in your 20s is the lack, not maybe not the lack, but you're not tied down to so, as many things. So you can you know, be free and experiment and open multiple doors. And, you know, when they close, they don't bang so loud, so to speak. And they're not as damning. Let's talk about film and talk about, I've got one question I was going to ask later, actually, but I thought maybe we could go straight into it. So when you're writing a script or do you write scripts Mm -hmm. or do you read them and and say, this is good. I read them. You read read them, them and I okay. analyze them and I help, I help writers write them. So I, I start from the beginning, breaking story and it developing their material all along the way. So it's, it's kind of like having a, a, a tiny co-writer on your shoulder. Okay, cool. And I mean, I guess a bit of a rubbishy question would be to ask what you look for when you're given a script, but maybe that will spark some further questions so what are you looking for when you're handed a script to go yeah this has got legs you know it's not so much what I look for as what I feel um and I think that's the way that audiences are in the theater too you're not you're not watching to see if they make mistakes right you're watching to experience something and have it it evoke emotion right yes. so for for me when i when i am reading something and suddenly i'm feeling the way that the character feels or i'm worried for the character mm-hmm. or i'm frightened or i'm just laughing um that to me is is makes me feel like okay the script is working the story is creating the emotion in its reader that it intends to create in its viewer so yes. that is kind of what I hope for when I'm reading a script. So you engage in, I suppose, what we all engage in when we watch something is you almost embody the character and you take on their wants and desires as you know as best as you can, given you know the information you've got, and you've obviously honed that ability to do that from the maybe limited is the wrong word, but from the simplified structure of a script as opposed to an actual piece of film where an audience would watch and go you have to have the ability to do that at an earlier stage on in the process obviously you know in the pre-production stage of the you know the development do you kind of get what I said there or was that a load of jumble yeah yeah you know a script isn't is has more to it um, than people think. It has a lot of meat on its bones. Yes. Um, uh, you can visualize 
in a in a good script you can visualize the world you can visualize everything that is in the scene so it should feel like you're reading a movie that's in your mind yeah you shouldn't have to impose well how would you do this right that's sort of what a, a director's job is or even an actor's job but the reader should be reading descriptions that bring you into the scene and dialogue that's organically coming out of the scene. So a really good script makes it very easy. You don't have to pretend, you don't have to jump into anybody's body, you don't have to like, you know, it it, yeah. it becomes visual for you in your mind. That's a good script. Do you write with the, how do you navigate the dynamic of like writer, director, actor, sort of triad, tree triad of their perception of a script do you write in mind what a director might want or what an actor in other words what do you write the, what is the script's perspective what do you embody when you're reading it and go this is correct this isn't quite correct this needs to be adjusted another weird question well um so 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 back to sort of what a writer's job is okay um again a writer's job is to show you the scene with words um the writer can do that by by you know expressing what um a landscape looks like expressing what uh, somebody's emotion is as they walk into that field, um, expressing uh, the emotion of the of the words as they say something. But they're not going to create a camera direction. They're mm. not going to say wide shot on yeah. that landscape. They're not going to say you know medium shot on the person as they walk there. They're not going to say close up on that yeah. face. It, does, it actually doesn't do anything, right? So the director can interpret the visuals that are so clear because the writer's written it. And then also the actor, and when I say put emotion in, it doesn't mean micromanage every single line. It just means sort of what emotion is the character feeling in that moment? And then the actor can take that emotion and interpret how they do that emotion any way that they want. So it is a, a fine line between describing and overwriting. You don't want to overwrite, but you do want to describe and you do want to make it feel visual and emotional. And that's a great template for a director or an actor. Yes, there's, I'm, I can't, I should, well, maybe, but I should have checked his name beforehand, but there's a, a guy who came up with like, is it the 60, 20, 10 rule or something? Or of, a sh I think it maybe is to do with a shot as opposed to a script, but he said, every shot needs to be sort of re uh, revolve around 60% emotion, maybe 20%, I don't know, cinematography and 10% something. I'm not sure what it was, but from what you're saying, emotion is, is, is obviously the, maybe the key aspect of reading and executing. Yeah, it, it is because you it elicits an, an emotional response um but that also sometimes people confuse it as everything has to be very tragic yeah. everything has to, everybody has to stop and monologue and and have a deep wound and i don't i don't believe that i mean i think sometimes you know playfulness and joy and just you know or cynicism or you know there are certain it, it's that idea that we could move very fast through something it's still emotional it could still be positive it could still be funny that's still emotional you know so i don't want anybody to think i'm i'm saying you have to write it has to be deep all the time or it doesn't work i don't actually believe that no not at all it, it, you've got to have the waves haven't you you've got to have the peaks and the troughs of different emotion that's what that's what is grip that's what grips us when we watch a film or watch a television series it's that sort of uh oscillation of emotion that we find really compelling and attractive yeah yeah so ne another question sort of going on from that what do you think what do you think the significance of narrative is and why do you think we love stories oh that's an, a really interesting question 
I think it's, I think it's that it's trying to make sense or put control to things that don't make sense and that we don't have any control over. And so watching someone go through a journey based on a conflict and they are trying to make sense of it, um, it just kind of, it, it, it helps us make choices in life. So that, that character might not always make the right choice, but then we see what happens when they don't. You know, somebody else gets to live out mistakes for us. Yes. Or sometimes people get to live out fantasies for us, right? Yes. Like, oh, yes. I wish I could do this thing. If only I'd said the character's doing that, you can see what that looks like. So a narrative structure is, is you know, we like that because we can, we can see a choice through. Mm. And if it's a happy end, we can say, oh, those are the choices that were made that got there. If it's a tragic end, same thing. But it takes us through a whole experience and satisfies our curiosity and sometimes gives us that sense of, of control over events. I think that might be part of why we like narrative so much. Absolutely. I really like that, that our desire to, or our capacity to live sort of vicariously without having to engage through people that we watch and through stories and you know the the level of wisdom that can be i uh i think because what i'm doing with this podcast is attempting to help people navigate life but i think but the great thing about movies is movies also do that but they do it in a way that is embodied and it's in the form of a story and people are far more receptive to stories and drama and cinema than they are to facts i think that we we perceive the world through a story and narrative is fundamental is almost the fundamental aspect of what makes humans what makes us human i, I think to possibly oh no i was just saying i think that's why we use those terms like even in politics people are always like oh they're framing it that way yes, or their yeah. narrative is Mm. You know, or his story is right. It's it's always like, what point of view are you choosing? You're absolutely right. Like we use storytelling in everything that we do um, to, and we'll listen to a story. And like you said, we might not always listen to a list of facts, but those facts can come through in a story and educate yeah. us and change our hearts and minds. Yeah. And oh, what was I going to say? Yes, you're right with the the, the politics and the the everything is narrative and that's where i was speaking to a, a psychologist no he was a doctor actually who said he has people coming to him saying he's for you know i'm not sure he's from america and he said that nowadays the sort of the landscape of narrative that's being sort of pushed onto people has become so extreme that people are falling out with their families and stuff because we are now it, the 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 medium of narrative is so deep into who we are that we can't look at it from afar we have to you know we attach ourselves to it to such a degree and then people you know arguments and falling outs occur because of these differing views of opinions and it all comes down to the narratives that we're being fed or that we perceive the world as a result of our you know past experiences and stuff that's that's interesting so i would imagine his job i mean if you're going to therapy that a therapist's job is to take the big picture and say but what's the story you're all in yes. right and be able to ground it and give perspective that way. And when we're watching something that has an ensemble cast, we sit there in our wisdom and go, oh, that person is misunderstanding that person. What's really going on is, so yeah. we're kind of like this audience therapist that's watching mm. and saying, you, you're all so locked into your individual stories. So yeah. that might be one way of, of looking at this is, even though we speak narrative, we wanna make sure that we don't get lost in our personal narratives, we wanna like, What's the big picture? What's this really about? 
And TV and movies sometimes that do that right can can help us. Yeah, there's that sort of dramatic irony type aspect to, like, as you said, an ensemble cast where that we get to act as that sort of uh, vantage point view down on the lives of the characters and say, well, this they're interacting in a certain way and it's causing this sort of miscommunication and this sort of uh, maladaptive behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, that's a good way of looking at it. I like that. I've I've put here I because I was when I was doing my research on you in my notes I've written down I just wanted to get your idea on this thing that I put down so for me personally the the great thing about a movie or a film is that you can watch it at one point in your life and take something away from it and then you can watch it at another point of your life and what and take something else away from it so in that sense it's almost like a living entity that we interact with Mm -hmm. and it informs I think you touched on that idea earlier actually and it informs us different about different aspects of you know humanity and life at different points of us watching it what do you you know have you ever thought of it like that or do you think that's an interesting idea or is that a load of rubbish I I love that I I know I think it's absolutely right especially you know as you get older that's when you start yes. realizing, you kind of look back, you, you, you'll watch something again and say, oh, I never noticed that part of it. Mm, yeah. um, Steven Spielberg is kind of famous for saying that in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm. he wouldn't have written that as a married man with children. He wrote that as a single man without children. And okay. the reason he said that is because that man has sort of this emotional break as a result of, you know, being driven to see this spaceship and he kind of leaves it all. And he, he he sort of abandons his responsibilities and goes toward this thing, which as a young single man, Steven Spielberg thought was very passionate. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you have kids, you get married and you go, what the heck was that guy doing? Stay home, you know, get some help. So, (laughs) so it is interesting that we look back, you know, we can rewatch something and have a completely different, point of view. And I wonder if that's what we mean when we say something's timeless. It's yes. not that it's reflective of our time, it's that we can watch it at any point in time, any decade even, mm. generationally we can watch it and still get something out of it that's reflective of the human experience. So, I think you make a really good point. Yes. And you you bring up Steven Spielberg and you, you mentioned DreamWorks. Have you worked, have you been involved in anything Steven Spielberg has done? Well, let's see. I was there. I came in right as Jurassic, right after Jurassic Park had like made Amblin Entertainment. Like, oh my gosh, okay. you know, yes, it was, a, yeah, it was yeah. a, a big deal. So for a while, there was like a lot of uh, commercial material coming in. Um, and I got to, I, I got to sort of see different elements of that. Every once in a while, I would be given, you know, a, a project and, you know, here, do some notes on it or whatever. Um, I think, you know, I always sort of gravitate toward, like when DreamWorks became DreamWorks, yep. it suddenly had sort of a more serious tone to it. Um, uh, American Beauty is the thing that I think started grounding it. Hmm. Um, somewhere in there, I had... Um, read Saving Private Ryan. And I was only in my 20s. And it was only submitted as a writing sample, which a writing sample means um, we're not going to make it just just look at the writing. But I was so blown away with by it. Because even as a a young woman in my 20s, who didn't know anything about war and had grown up in a, a peacetime world, I felt so much of what was going on with these characters. And it had such a high concept uh, that was driving these soldiers toward their goal. Um, And it was just really beautifully written as far as like communicating that the horrors of war Mm. um, and the adventures of it, and even the nobility of it, the, the, the sort of the, you know, the world war two. Yes. So um, that was one where I remember going, why aren't you making this? (laughs) Yes. 
and uh, and it was uh, it it was resubmitted, and they did end up making it. Um, wow. And I had, don't know if it had anything to do with my analysis, but I do remember I'm thinking sure this was this was amazing. It was cool to be on that side of it to see when it was just submitted. But again, I can't take credit for it. I can just say I was I was there. Yeah, but of course that's a that's an incredible uh, sort of indictment of your ability to you know see that potential because obviously, as you're well aware way more than I am but the amount of scripts that get sort of you know sent and put in a cupboard or you know I you know it's 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 kind of like everything but the the success rate is like well it's so small isn't it to get for even someone to pick up a script and look at it is meant meant that you've already beat or out competed a lot of other people which is you know which is yeah, do you have anything to say about that? What how's the well, what's it's it's so much better than it used to be. People it, people okay. are always like, oh god, it's dying. No, because I mean think about it. Think about the platforms. Think about when you turn on your TV, how many movies you could watch on how many different platforms yeah. that might not even have been released in the theater. The opportunity to get your story out there, you know, and for TV, for TV writers. You know, again, so many different shows, so many different platforms. So, you know, there was a, a time when it was just these studios, these yeah. networks done. And there's so much. On uh, In addition, um, cameras uh, have gotten more accessible and cheaper, um, you know, video and sound yeah. equipment. You know, we're we're on a platform for that. Um, yeah. So. So if you want to make your own thing, if you want to be an independent filmmaker, there are so many more resources and it's, it's a, it's a doable prospect. It doesn't mean that it's not going to take money or, or effort. It will, but I, I feel like it's become a more content driven, hopeful time. It certainly ebbs and flows right now because of all the strikes that have happened, people are scared to take yeah. things on and, and they're just treading lightly. But I've also seen that trend, like I've seen it sort of break through again. And I feel like that's, you know, again, people will be mm -hmm. like, yep, come on, bring it on. So it, it makes sense to keep writing through all of these, these, these periods and not to get in, oh, well, they'll never make it. There, there's, there are options out there. Um, it is hard like any other creative endeavor, but, um, but, but everyone wants a story. Everybody wants content. Yeah. And there's always that chance that I think, is it the Blair Witch Project that had a budget of, I don't know, nothing and went on to gross millions and millions and millions. And did they even upload it on YouTube? Was it, or maybe it was before YouTube, but it, it yeah, it, you know, um, I, I, I can't remember how, what, I think, I think it was YouTube, but the idea was they were so smart in creating what everybody thought was a real narrative at first. Mm. The idea of this found footage that had come out, you know, at first there were, there were some people who were like, oh my God, oh my God, did you see this? Right. Oh, that, wow. It was doing what, you know, what we do all the time now, right. We're always trying to sort of you know, create some kind of a realistic campaign that will bring people into fictional worlds, right? But yeah. everybody knows what's going on. Everybody knows the trick, you know, but there's always that person who did it first. So there was a little bit of that buzz, but that was exactly the point of the movie is oh, we found, found, we found footage. Here it is. And they created a narrative and there was nothing there. It was like a, you know, a, a camera really up close to some, some, woman's very panicked face which made you feel panicked right yeah. and one creepy shot at the end you know brilliant brilliant so smart um but i do think you're right to sort of focus on that project because i do think it changed not only what could be done in film but in these campaigns these uh, social media campaigns that yeah. go around it 
you know, that, that continue to try and sort of feed emotion to us so that we'll be driven to the fictional narrative. I want to yeah. talk about sort of like morality in with sort of within the characters and like and good and evil and you mentioned Spielberg and I think Spielberg is a great is really nails how he sort of navigates that uh path of good and evil so I think you know the opening scene in ET the way that the the government are presented in a way that makes them look incredibly villainous I was incredibly scared of ET mm-hmm. as a child and looking back on it now, I think... Oh, my was, kids were too. Yeah. Really scared. Yeah, they it. were like freaked out by Literally. E.T. Freaked out. It's so Literally. funny. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think maybe in hindsight, it had something to do with that opening scene. The scene where they're chasing him through the the woods and, you know, the way that Spielberg, as I said, sort of portrayed the government, never showed them in the same in the same way he did with Jaws, I suppose, but I think that was always until right at the end, and you turn out actually they're kind of the villains, but they're actually not really the villains of the film. They're sort of if you look at the way that they were portrayed up until the final scene where they break into the house, you'd think they had far more sinister plans for E.T., but actually they were quite sort of kind and compassionate to the whole situation they weren't the sort of villainous evil scientists that they were painted out to be in the early stages of the film i think uh to some degree and and that was always good and then uh, the other example is you know jaws and the way that they hide the shark until a certain moment and the opening scene is also really poignant i think because you know, it's dark and everything. And I suppose that's horror, to be fair. That's slightly different. What do you think, when you read a script, and because most, you know, most Hollywood blockbusters are have some form of good versus evil, goody versus baddie. Do you, you know, what have you learned from that? And what do you take away from reading a script when you say, you know, this is a compelling villain and this is a compelling hero or not. So I want to make it very clear that I'm not old enough to have been on any development end of Jaws or E.T. <laughs> I just want to be very clear about that. Yes, All right. No, no, I was yeah, a kid yeah. for both of those too. Um, I wasn't implying but, that. Uh, All right. Just, 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 just okay. Um, yeah, you said, Jaws, you World, though, I think yeah. it's... No, no, Jaws is, is one of those movies going back to what's timeless. Yes. I think you can watch it in any generation and it speaks to you, not only because of the scares of how they sort of hid the shark and then and mm. then brought it out. And they did that all for budgetary reasons. Really? Um, but because... Wow. Yeah, yeah. With the shark, it was because they just didn't really have the, sh- the whole shark, you know? Yeah. So they had to do it in a way that used music and it, and, and it was hiding it because that's all that they could do, but they, they created a, a slow burn of tension yes. in doing that. Incredibly really, effective. really interesting. If you see any reading of Jaws stuff, you it's, it's fascinating. But, but what I love about Jaws is talk about timeless and morality. Who aren't they listening to through the whole thing? that they end up suffering uh, as a result of not listening to him. Yeah. It's the scientist. Mm. They don't listen to the scientist. Now, now let's put that in COVID, in the COVID years. You know, here we are, you know, still not listening to scientists or climate change. Okay, who are we ignoring? What disaster happens as a result when you don't listen to the scientists? Yeah. You know, so it's timeless. It's timeless. It's right there. Um, even our, how we treat old people, who don't they listen to? They don't listen to this old Quint guy who says, hey, don't take this lightly. I've been there. I've had experience. Mm. And everybody goes, hey, shut up, old timer. Right? Yeah. But in the end, they need his skills to actually get to the shark. Right? Again, how do we treat old people? We say, yeah, well, yeah you don't know anything until you're right and you have 
a lifetime of skills. So I, I look at that movie now from, from, from this perspective and I go, wow, they're still talking about the same things. Plus it's a kick-ass movie. The, yeah. the acting in it is so realistic. It's great. <laughs> yes. And also the, they don't listen to Chief Brody, do they either? And it, it ultimately comes down to uh, monetary gain, doesn't it? They don't want to close the beach because of the 4th of July and uh, the, the money. It's basically it's a commentary on you know capitalism as well to some degree. Yes, and also, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and also it's a commentary yeah. on something that I wanted to get into, which is the hero's journey. Do you know what the hero, have you heard of the, like the hero's journey? Yeah. Sure. Of course you have. Sorry. Um, so it's another <laughs> one of oh, it's another one of them in the sense of because Brody's scared of the water, isn't he? And I, I'm not quite. Oh, I've frozen. There we go. Brody's scared of the water, and I'm not quite sure why he's scared of the water, but he doesn't like it, and that's that's what immediately that's what puts his guard up and makes him uh, explore the notion of maybe there's a shark. Whereas everyone else goes, oh no, that's fine, and it's kind of like a commentary on maybe the benefit of a little bit of apprehension and and how fear can be beneficial in terms of opening your eyes to something and and the awareness. That was that wasn't what I was going to say. That was a little side note, but I, I just um, yeah, I in terms of the. I really okay, like yeah. what you said there, Ali, actually, because when we talk about character development um, in my classes, I'm often trying to get people to understand that a character's flaw can actually mm -hmm. translate to a skill and that nice. that's a character development arc that they could focus on rather than just going, and he's not afraid of the water anymore. Well, yes. Okay. So by the end, he's, he's, you know, more adventurous in the water. He's not, he's conquered his fear. But as you said, that fear itself also becomes a skill because he's looking at the water as the enemy and he's the person who's who's realizing there's an enemy out there. But it also makes people not trust him because they say that's just your fear getting in the way. So, Brilliant. yeah, flaw and skill, they, they go hand in hand. And it's really fun for writers to do the juggle of that with their characters. That will really help them with their character arcs yes it's incredibly well poised isn't it that sort of as you said that character development so just expanding on from that why do you I've kind of we kind of already I sort of already asked you this at the beginning but I remember I did film studies in college which is not your college it's in England our like fi your final two years of high school is what we do as college before we go to university and i remember learning about oh, okay. i think it's todorov's five act structure is that right mm -hmm. and it's you know and it's um the, it's... i you carry on sorry no i i uh sorry we have a tiny bit of a delay uh yes we do between yes. us um uh i i there are so many people that have analyzed story structure. Um, I know about the five act structure. I teach it in TV. Um, I don't necessarily apply it to feature, but it's good to know about how everybody sort of breaks down a beginning, middle and end to see what's helpful to you as a writer, as far as organizing your story. So what, what do you, what would you apply or do you apply to a, a feature? given what you just said, I'm intrigued now. What I, what I do when I'm, when I'm teaching um, is just do four parts. Um, I take act two and, and just divide it into two, two a, uh, act two A, act two B. So now it would be act one, act two A, act two B, and act three. And act one okay. is setting things up. And act two A is when you're in the adventure, but then there's a midpoint that kind of focuses that adventure. So now we're in act two B, it tends to be a little more mission-based and gets a lot more sort of pushback. And then act three is solving the problem, not in a, a pat way, but in a way that has to use everything that you've learned in act one, two A and two B to actually solve things. So 
that's that's the structural path that I usually point people toward just because it's simple, you know, and they can do a lot of creativity within it. It doesn't tell yeah. them what they have to have on every page, which drives me a little bit bonkers. Mm. I had a, maybe last year I had a hypnotherapist and psychologist on and she was, we were talking about trauma and she was saying how trauma is effectively an incomplete loop or an incomplete memory. And obviously, obviously often that occurs, can occur in childhood because when you're a child, your ability to make sense of the world is incredibly uh, limited. So therefore any loop that's made or, you know, loop, bad experience, you can't complete it yourself. You can't rationalize and, you know, look at the world judgmentally. And why do you think, and that, that for me, that leads into narrative and how we're obsessed with closing the loop so to speak and making meaning and you know as you said here there's you know act three is a solution resolution do you ever wonder why movies end in resolutions 99 percent of the time and we because if you're driven if, if you're driven to a movie because there's an idea or a problem there. That's usually what it is. It's sort of like, mm. oh, that's a big problem. The first thing that you ask is, I wonder how they're going to fix it. Or mm. even if it's, oh, that's a spectacular idea. I, I, I bet it's going to create all kinds of complications, though. I wonder how they're going to get through it. So you, you, you watch something because you want to know how will it be yeah. completed? How will it be finalized? How will it be solved? That doesn't mean we always have to have a happy ending. It means a completion. And sometimes a main character has to die to complete the task at hand. Yeah. But it's often for maybe a greater good or some, or we've learned from it, you know, in some kind of way. We leave changed from these stories. So if you're going in just seeing, well, here's a problem and, and, and here's how it's affecting somebody over and over and over and over again, but it just goes on and on and on. And you don't leave feeling like any choices were made or there was any completion to it. You feel incomplete. And I mean, think about like when you've gone to movies, you might say, gosh, I really like the beginning, but the ending kind of, kind mm, of stunk, yeah. you know, it's because it wasn't, it wasn't trying to problem solve in an interesting way. Mm. It might've been like, oh, then the hero saved the day. Okay, you know, you're not ending something to give somebody a happy ending. You're ending something to to work something out. So I, I hope that answers your question. No, it does, yeah. It, you know, there comes a point where people know what's gonna happen, but it's not about what happens, it's about the way it happens. That's one of the things that separates something good from something great or even something brilliant, I yeah. suppose, is it happens in a way that is compelling and originally new to, it's original to a point of comprehension without being too, you know, avant-garde and too out there so that people are like, what the heck just happened? Uh, that's what it's <laughs> about, isn't it? Yes. I think, yes. And that brings back to, not brings back, but, and it's the way, you know, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, I used to, you, you watch things over and over, over again. And kids do that a lot. And they're really, you know, they're gripped by things. And one of the, it's not really certain why, but I think that there are multiple levels of understanding and it's kind of like the thing we said earlier about how a piece is timeless. You understand it on a different level as you get older. You what? But when you're young, you understand it maybe on a maybe on like a sort of macro or broad level, and therefore it takes longer to compute. Or I don't know, but it is interesting how kids can watch films that are really you know, way beyond their level of comp comprehension, not like little, not like words, but in terms of like meaning, you know, Lion King's a great example. Lion King's an incredibly complicated 
and sort of uh, film in terms of like dynamics of life and the world and it's Hamlet isn't it and it's that and Hamlet is the story of the is basically the story of the patriarchy in the terms of the evil patriarch and the good patriarch and how the evil patriarch always plans to overthrow the good patriarch and the evil patriarch doesn't want the new generation to uh have any control because they're the new the new generation is what refreshes the society but there's loads of other things about it so the, but and you know people kids love the lion king i, I didn't realize until quite recently i think it was the highest grossing disney film well the highest grossing animated film ever and then maybe one of the top grossing films of all time and then obviously titanic came along a few years later and obviously washed it away because it washed everything away but <laughs> i forgot what i forgot what we were talking about i went down a, a, oh yeah the, the talking of, about how, how kids perceive yeah. story right yeah. in film um yeah. I, I really have to agree what i like about it is they just look at the pure story so if mm. you they watch something and you say what was the story they will tell it back to you very simply and that's the bones of the story. Want to mm. hear a good pitch? Hear a kid pitch back. Yeah. An adult, we micro focus on all of these things are really, really more per, more reflective of our point of view. Mm. We might, uh, you know, say, "Oh, but that was so violent. That was so sexual." Right? Kids not going to do that because they they are not seeing the symbolism yet. They haven't experienced yeah. what we experience. You know. Um, you know. It, so it, it, so sometimes it's the you know what would how would a kid describe this might actually be a good thing for a writer because it will make you realize like what's the the pure story you're trying to tell you know mm. not what is sort of like the cynical analysis of my story what's Absolutely, the pure yeah. story like what's, a kid what's at the core of the story Tell me in two sentences. Yeah. What scripts have you been, have you been given any scripts in the past that have gone on to be huge films or gone on to do certain things that you can talk about? Well, I'm very excited that I'm very excited that just this past week, a script that I helped develop with my client, Tracy Lehman. Um, again, I work story to script, yeah. right? So we broke story on it, mm -hmm. assigned her deadlines. And I was, we did four, we, I consulted segment by segment with all the rewrites as well on that script. It's called Bob Trevino Likes It. It went to South by Southwest, which is a huge festival out here. And it won for best narrative feature. Wow. And that is just last week. Um, I'm trying to like South by Southwest is, such a, a big festival. I mean, it's it's kind of like winning, it's close to winning Sundance. It's a big wow. deal. Um, uh, John, Le John Leguizamo is in it. Barbie Ferreira is in it. Um, and so now with that win, I'm positive that it'll probably get distribution and you'll see it on some platform, if not in the theater. So I'm very, very pleased about it. That is a special movie. Yep. And um and yeah, so, so keep an eye out. What are your favorite films? Let's let's just do that. Have you got a top five favorite films of all time, and why? I guess is the key, given your expertise. <sighs> top five. It's hard for me because I I'm like everybody else. I kind of fall in love with whatever I've recently seen. Yes, of course. But I will say one movie. Talk about timelessness. Okay, a movie that I watched when I was very young. I have rewatched, and I don't rewatch very much. I've rewatched at different points in my life. And it I feel like it always speaks to me. It's always so well. Uh, the narrative is so good on it. Mm. The character arcs are so good on it. And not a lot of people know it the way they know other classic films. So it's a movie called, called Paper Moon. And uh, the director was Peter Bogdanovich. Um, but I love the writing of it. And I, 
um, I show it in my writing feature film class. I show clips from it to show um, a, a, a really solid structure in, in practice without it being sort of conventional in its execution. Mm. It actually was made in black and white at a time when it didn't have to be. Mm. <laughs> it was the seventies, it wasn't a black and white time. Nice. Um, but I think that's a great movie and I would recommend people watch it. It's called Paper Moon. Again, had Tatum O'Neill and Ryan O'Neill um, who are actually father and daughter. Nice, okay. right, final question. Breaking point. What was your career breaking point where maybe you realized, oh, oh, you know, like, I guess another way of putting it would be an aha moment, a huge aha moment or something where you read something and went, oh, you know, everything's fallen into place here. Or I now see things in a differently to the way that I used to, you know, it's an incredibly broad question. I know. Is there just one moment where that sort of comes to mind? When it comes to scripts, I, I'm not blowing smoke when I say that I learn constantly at, uh, about the world and other people's point of view in the work that I do uh, with a lot of scripts. So I can't say there's one breaking point when I went, ah, that is the script. Um, I I will say that things in my life that I've experienced as I get older have made me a stronger writer mm. and have made me have, yeah. oh, oops, I said stronger writer, sorry, a stronger analyst yes. and have made me um, see, see, uh, made me, I think, better at what I do. Yes. And so for me, I guess that breaking point was very personal. It was the death of my mother. Wow, In yeah. 2016, um, my mom passed away fairly young at 71. Mm. Um, and everybody's, you know, everybody's parent is going to die eventually. And, but I had never really experienced a close personal death and like that. Um, yeah. and it made me suddenly have a new perspective on the scripts that I read that were exploring this yeah. because prior to that, I was just sort of imagining what that must feel like. Now I know what it feels mm. like. I also understand the, you know, that, that feeling you get after a death of your own mortality mm. that often drives characters yeah. to do what they do. Mm. Um, so I have to say that was my breaking point as far as becoming more of a grown up in life yeah. and having a, a more intense perspective, a better understanding of the stories that I was reading. Yeah. Um, I hope it's not everybody's breaking point, but for me, that was that was one. Does that go absolutely, under the category of what you're talking absolutely, about? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I just final remark: that's the great thing about your, you know, profession and career, and I suppose just fortunate as well is that your inner life, you enrich your work through the sensations and the experiences of your own life. You're 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 able to you. You, you're constantly evolving and improving you know entity I suppose in that sense because the more experience you get the more you can put that into analyzing and understanding life and experience and and you know that's what that's the beauty of what you're doing and what you get to do brilliant thank you so much I, thank you so much for this conversation Ali. You. I mean you're you know you really asked them thought provoking questions Thank and, you. and I appreciate it. It's always nice to have these conversations to sort of go, Oh yeah, this is how I feel about things. Absolutely. So.